Okay, so uh, we usually start right on time, but you know, phone stuff is a little strange. So we'll, we'll kind of leisurely <laughs> get to it. Um, yeah, I don't want to look at myself all okay. the time. Uh, so welcome to uh, the Free Minds Film, the intersection of policy and filmmaking. Um, whereas people trickle in, we're just going to run down what we're actually doing today. Yeah. So we're very excited. This is the very first time that we are partnering with Pepperdine School of Public Policy as represented by Dean Pete Peterson. Right. <laughs> and the director of the DeVoe Moore Center in Florida State, uh, Sam Staley. Yep. But just uh, to be politically correct, we're balancing uh, things by also having Lindsay Weissmuller, who is a graduate of the University of Florida. Oh. <laughs> Hey, you didn't tell me about that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, guys. Remember, you're being recorded, so uh, we wanted you to agree. You're being recorded. Yeah. So, okay. Session one will be, and and me, how films change minds and laws. Um, session two, you don't have to be a film student to have a career in film. That will be an interview with Pete Peterson and Sam Staley. And session three will be the casting director's take on making important ideas entertaining, and that is when Courtney and I will be talking with uh, Lindsay. And session four is Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, please submit them. How do we do that? Uh, yeah, you can just send them to me, Courtney Balaker. Uh, you, you can make them public or private, uh, whichever you want. Um, but yeah, just send me your questions and then I will uh, Ted and I will read them out and we will uh, have answers, hopefully. And uh, so the total event time will be 90 minutes. And, you know, maybe I can read some of the bios now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Pete Peterson, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the Dean of Pepperdine University School of Public Policy. He's a leading national speaker and writer on issues related to civic participation and the use of technology to make government more responsive and transparent. He was uh, the first executive director of the bipartisan organization Common Sense California, which joined with the Davenport Institute at the School of Public Policy to become the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership. Uh, Pete writes for many, many impressive outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, as well as numerous blogs. Uh, his, his bio is much longer than that, uh, so please check it out at the uh, at the event side, but don't do that right now. <laughs> uh, and Sam Staley also, uh, uh, same thing with, with his bio, check out the, the whole thing at the event bio. He is the director of the DeVoe Moore Center in the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy at Florida State University. He's also a research fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, where he writes on pop culture and movies. Sam is the author of eight nonfiction books that doesn't include his fiction books. But his fiction, his nonfiction includes uh, contemporary film and economics, lights, camera, econ, and skills and economics, entrepreneurship, innovation, and the making of cultural revolution. Sam is the author of more than 120 academic and professional articles and studies. His commentary has appeared in the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, Reason Magazine, National Review, Planning Magazine, and scores of other popular outlets. We are very happy to have Sam and Pete with us today. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll just keep the, uh, why don't we just keep the uh, intros going? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to talk about Lindsay? Yes, yeah. I will. I need my notes, Lindsay. There's we, so much we, going we on. Call Lin line. We, call her, uh, we call her Lindsay Sundance, because everything she touches <laughs> goes to Sundance. That's right. Lindsay Weissmuller is a very dear friend of ours, but she's also a brilliant casting director uh, for feature films and television. She's currently in production on season two of the Netflix comedy series special. Uh, some of her recent projects include True TV's comedy series, Adam Ruins Everything, which we adored and miss. Uh, Searching, starring John Cho and Deborah Messing, which was a Sundance uh, darling. It was a $1 million uh, Sundance film that grossed nearly $100 million worldwide. Voltage's Ava, starring Jessica Chastain and Colin Farrell, which was acquired by Amazon Studios and set for release in 2020. 
and Red Hours Plus One, starring Maya Erskine and Jack Quaid, which won the Audience Award at Tribeca in 2019. Blumhouse's Slate, which was at Sundance in 2016, and IFC Midnight's Carnage Park, which was also at Sundance 2016. So we welcome Lindsay, who will be talking a little bit later in the event. Uh, so let's get to it. This event is, is about 90 minutes. Again, if you have questions, send them to Courtney uh, via chat. And you can do that. Uh, you don't have to wait. You can do that whenever the question occurs to you. So let's get to it. All right. And if uh, I, I'm assuming everyone can see the um, presentation we have, if, if you if you're having issues, please just send me a, a message and, and we can address it. Uh, so uh, this is what Pepperdine University looks like uh, from a boat. If you haven't seen it, it's beautiful. And, uh, and uh, so it's not just, an, uh, it's not just for uh, intellectuals, it's also for uh, lovers of aesthetics, which is, which is really great for the, the combination of, of factors and elements that we're discussing today. And did you know that Free Minds Film is coming to Pepperdine this fall, um, as long as Gavin Newsom allows it? Um, do we do we know anything more about that, Pete? Is it is it, it last we spoke? It, that seemed highly likely that everything would be okay. Yeah, we are planning to start on ground here in mid-August. Um, obviously, you know we're kind of on a week-to-week -week basis, not only with the state but with the county learning all new things about uh, state and county public policy these days. But uh, as it stands today, we are a go. Awesome. So, uh, so this event today is, is something of a, uh, the function is to whet the appetite for what's coming next uh, at, in fall. And Sam and his uh, Florida State DeVoe Moore Center people will be there as well. So that will be a great time. Uh, so who are we? Uh, Courtney and Ted. Courtney, who are you? So my, I'm, I'm Courtney Balaker, and uh, I am a film producer and director. Um, I started my career in New York as an off-Broadway theater director, and then I moved to Los Angeles and with the intention of directing, but I kind of fell into producing, which was really great. It was a great way to learn a business I had never worked in. Um, I worked for a production company that made a lot of horror films for Dimension Films, which is Bob Weinstein's company at the time. And uh, we also I made a we bunch of- thought we agreed not to say that word. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're allowed to say the word Weinstein. I don't know, but uh, the Bob, Bob, was, Bob was not like his brother. <laughs> um, but we made a bunch of horror films and it was really fun. And I, I was at the time a fan of horror films. We also made a bunch of American Pie sequels for Universal, uh, but, as much as I loved the people I was working with and, and what I was learning, I didn't feel like I was putting really great content into the world with horror films and American Pie movies. And so Ted and I decided to launch our own production company called Corchula Productions, which we can tell you a little bit about in a minute. Um, but uh, we, uh, I've, I've also produced for PBS, a documentary series for them. Um, and I've worked for the Oprah Winfrey Network. And so, uh, but I really feel at home making feature films and, and TV series that have something meaningful to me. All right, uh, and I'm Ted and I'm uh, Courtney's husband and producing partner. And um, I started my career in media and TV with uh, the John Stossel unit at ABC News. We did hour long specials and then I moved to uh, Reason first working as a, a policy analyst, actually with uh, this guy named Sam Staley. Um, and then I uh, was the first producer of uh, Reason TV and did uh, the Drew Carey project. Um, and, uh, and then after, after a while, I guess it was in 2011, as Courtney mentioned, we decided to start our own company, Corchula Productions. As she mentioned, our motto is making important ideas entertaining. Um, here are two of our films. Uh, the first is Can We Take a Joke? It's about uh, comedy and outrage culture. It's, uh, the tagline is what happens when outrage and comedy collide. And so it was kind of a sneaky way to talk about free speech. Uh, we partnered with a great organization, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, also known as FIRE. Um, and that one was a documentary. Uh, the other one we're focusing on today is a narrative film, but based on a true story, and Courtney, you can tell me about that. 
Yeah, we released Little Pink House, which is a narrative feature film starring Catherine Keener and June Triplehorn. Uh, it came out in 2018, and it's based on a true story about a very infamous Supreme Court case called Kilo versus New London, which was about eminent domain abuse. Uh, it was based on a book of the same title, Little Pink House, and um, it brought, uh, we can talk a little bit about this because it is an issue-oriented film that had an impact campaign, uh, but we were, we were really pleased by the reception it, it got. It's a rather obscure topic, but it had a very human and compelling story to it. And it's really more broadly about property rights and even more broadly just about um, force and volunt like what's a better way to deal to interact with people using force or using uh, voluntary interaction. We say voluntary. Um, so, oh, so, you know, uh, as I mentioned, our, our motto is making important ideas entertaining. Another thing that we say a lot is uh, don't, don't just preach to the converted. And so we didn't want to be uh, the type of filmmakers who, who just went out and talked to people who already agreed with us. Um, the, the more challenging and we think more important thing to do is to talk to people who, who don't agree with us. Um, and that makes the storytelling uh, more challenging and it makes the marketing more challenging, um, but also makes it a lot more rewarding. Uh, and we will talk about that shortly. Um, so Free Minds Film, that's what we're all doing here today. Uh, our motto is don't just make a film, get people to see it. Um, Courtney and I thought that, you know, if we're going to go out on our own and make independent films, we really have to refine our understanding of, of the distribution landscape and really, in fact, refine our understanding of, of just reaching audiences. There are so many new tools these days, and it can either, either feel exhilarating or overwhelming to have all these new tools at your disposal. And we figured we, we're going to just dive right into this. And, and hopefully it'll end up feeling exhilarating, although it does feel overwhelming at times too. Um, so we thought we're gonna have to learn this stuff anyway, so why don't we share the information with people who share our values um, and share our passion for uh, human freedom. Uh, so again, the, uh, the motto for Free Minds Film is don't just make a film, get people to see it. We do seminars, workshops, and consulting services. And, um, we found another reason why we started this was people would come to us and ask advice for their film projects. And a lot of times Courtney and I would say, well, we wish you would have come to us like three years ago because you've kind of, you know, painted yourself into a corner with, with how, you've, uh, how you've made your film. And if your goal is to reach new people, it's kind of hard to do that with, in the way the film currently stands. So, our goal now is to get uh, liberty-minded filmmakers to think about reaching audiences early and often. Don't just fall in love. You know, you need, we need, uh, as filmmakers, heart is very important, but brain is very important, too. So let's, let's let the two of them uh, play together nicely. And who's that? Just a, a beautiful female friend of ours hanging out at a workshop uh, oh, mixer. There's, there's Lindsay <laughs> at a Free Minds Film event. Uh, drinking a lemonade or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're very proud of the caliber of, of expert presenters we get at Free Minds Film. Who's this guy, Courtney? That is a, another a good friend of ours, uh, Dan Lindsay, who won an Oscar for a feature documentary he made called Undefeated. Um, that's him receiving his Oscar. Um, yeah, he's, he's spoken at um, our Free Minds events uh, two or three times now. Um, he's a big supporter. Of, of what we're trying to do and um, and a vastly talented film lover. Great guy. So uh, films change minds and laws um, and that's because the moving picture medium is uniquely persuasive. So let's look at some examples. Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockovich. Uh, people bring this movie up a few, have brought it up a few times in relation to Little Pink House. It's it's similar that it's based on a true story about a single mom fighting against very powerful people. Um, this film uh, did wonderfully at the box office. Julia Roberts won an Oscar for it. Um, I think Steven Soderbergh was was nominated if he didn't win. Uh, but it basically made this thing called chromium six a household word. Um, it helped pass strict, stricter water regulations at state and federal levels. So this narrative feature film had a pretty big impact on on an issue, a policy issue. 
uh, an inconvenient truth. Uh, you've probably heard of this. It's Al Gore's movie about uh, climate change. It just had a massive impact on how people view the issue. And here's uh, results from one poll before 30% considered climate change a serious issue after 87%. And, and as you may know, there was a, a follow-up film, uh, a sequel to An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, North Country starring Charlize Theron. Um, this, uh, this was a participant media film. Uh, they are really on the forefront of doing the kinds of things that, that Courtney and I like to do, although they have much bigger <laughs> resources than we have, and generally a, a, a different uh, kind of worldview, but, but not all the time. Uh, so anyway, this, this, uh, this film came out at a time when the Violence Against Women Act was facing uncertain renewal in Congress. And um, so the team um, held a lot of Capitol Hill screenings and that helped, um, helped pass, the, uh, pass the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, Modern Family, Glee, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of TV shows that uh, have positive depictions of same-sex marriage. Um, and this is from uh, the Hollywood Reporter poll that found that uh, viewers were three times more likely to become more pro-same-sex marriage than against it if they were uh, to watch shows like Modern Family and Glee. Um, and here's, uh, what's yeah. Dallas for me? <laughs> I wonder how many of our uh, attendees even know what Dallas is. Yeah, although there was a reboot, I think a few years ago. Dallas was a really famous uh, primetime TV series in the 80s, right? Uh, went on for years, my, my mother was obsessed with it, so I, that, that's how I know of it. Um, and like I said, I think there was a reboot. But yeah, there, there apparently there's this fascinating story about uh, how it had an impact in Romania. Um, and, related to communism. So uh, yeah, TV and film, uh, it, it, it has an impact on the culture. And when that happens, uh, you're exposing much broader audiences to ideas that they probably would never even think about exploring unless it was in the moving picture format. Leo says you should mention the conversation. Great example. <laughs> you're sweet. No, oh, thank you, Leo. <laughs> the, conver the conversation was a short film that we made about the non-aggression principle, which uh, if anyone's interested in seeing it, I can, I can send it to them. Um, but that's, thanks, that's, thanks, a, that's, a, that's, that's a good an way. obscure reference. That's a, <laughs> you're you're awesome. gonna get a lot of people by just leading with it. Here's a film about non-aggression. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, and we're um, so we'll kind of zoom through these um, a bit. Uh, some highlights from, so here are some highlights from two of our impact campaigns. Uh, so this is a little pink house. And um, so here you see uh, the real Suzette Kilo at the end, uh, the actress who played Suzette Kilo, Catherine Keener, twice nominated for an Oscar. Um, and then the next guy, who's that? That's Scott Bullock, the president of the Institute for Justice. Uh, we, as Ted mentioned, we we worked very closely with them um, during Little Pink House. They were the law they were the law firm that represented Suzette Kilo uh, in front of the United States Supreme Court, and they were great partners. And they were a huge part of the Impact Campaign, which we can talk about in a little bit. And standing next to him is the legendary David Crosby, who wrote an original song for Little Pink House. He's very good friends with the author who is standing next to me named Jeff Benedict. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a crazy career there. And we, we like this photo because it, it, for a number of reasons, one, it shows uh, Catherine Keener and David Crosby, as you know, are very progressive people. Um, and yet they were, they were really, really important for, the, for this film. David Crosby actually uh, contributed a, a song to uh, to our soundtrack and, and Courtney directed the uh, the music video for it. Um, Catherine Keener again very progressive and she was obviously very supportive of the film. She was in it and not only that she came up with um, some of the most poignant um, framings of of uh, eminent domain abuse and what it is and, mm -hmm. and how we see it in the film. Um, so that's one reason we like this photo. Another one is just that Scott Bullock is, is a part of this group that people who run think tanks or public interest law firms just don't reach audiences like this, like uh, almost at all. And so uh, 
it's just a great way for IJ to reach uh, new audiences uh, with a very important message. Um, here's uh, another thing we're able to accomplish. We had um, a, a bipartisan congressional screening of Little Pink House. It was the first film since uh, uh, Lincoln by Steven Spielberg to be uh, given that honor. And uh, the guy that I'm hugging is Jamie Raskin, a Democrat from uh, Democratic congressman from Maryland. He was the one who spearheaded um, this effort. Um, and that was because uh, we screened the film at uh, which festival? It was the Provincetown International Film Festival yeah, in Massachusetts. And then he came up to Courtney and said he had this idea to have a congressional screening. And uh, a lot of hard work later, we were, we were able to pull it off. And there you see Dana Rohrbacher, uh, uh, formerly a congressman from Orange County, and then uh, Thomas Massey in the other photo, um, a Republican congressman uh, there. Um, and so we're, we're also very proud of the fact that Little Pink House changed uh, policy, reform policy at the state and federal, the state and local level, I should say. And here's one example from Provincetown, Massachusetts, uh, this fellow named Mike Riley, who uh, owned a bike rental shop and, and his small business and some others were threatened with eminent domain abuse and uh, Little Pink House um, helped, uh, helped save them from the bulldozers. Yeah, it was happening in Provincetown and he emailed me right before I flew out there and uh, he had a bunch of people come to the screening. He handed out flyers uh, after the Q&A and then the vote was like the, literally the following Monday and uh, his family got to keep their property um, because of the vote. And he credits the film for that. We were really, really pleased we could help. So this is uh, just one uh, clip from our, our earned media campaign. Um, and through the film and earned media, uh, Suzette's message and story reached tens of millions of people uh, here. Where, where, where are you right now with Suzette and Courtney on that photo? Oh yeah, we, we were really um, excited. Uh, we were on the Today Show together to promote the film the week of its release in New York City. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a shot of us on the Today Show. And that's an and and um, uh, Scott Bullock was also uh, was also there. And although he wasn't the focus of the interview, they did they did introduce him. He did he was allowed to answer some questions. Um, and and there was another instance where three or four million people were exposed to an idea in a venue that they really cared about and trusted. This was not on Fox News or something. This was NBC News. Um, today's show uh, with, with a mostly young woman um, audience uh, and that demographic tends to be overwhelmingly uh, progressive. And so here they were for about 10 minutes hearing this very compelling story from the, uh, the director and from the woman who lived at Suzette Kilo. So again, uh, tens of millions reached through film and earned media. Um, we made educational programming that's reached hundreds of thousands of students. Um, and as I mentioned, the state and local reforms. Um, we'll, we'll quickly go through, uh, can we take a joke? Again, that was our film on comedy and outraged culture. They're, they're calling it cancel culture these days. Um, one of our favorite days um, from that campaign was this, the, uh, uh, where we had a screening at uh, the museum in Washington, DC. And if you see all the sponsors down there, uh, we're, we're um, proud of the kind of motley crew of sponsors that you rarely see together, uh, such as the ACLU with the Charles Koch Institute, Flying Dog Brewery. <laughs> um, they provided the beer for the event, which made the, uh, the movie more enjoyable to everybody, <laughs> I'm sure. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we partnered with uh, the Foundation for, for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, um, and so they were a co-sponsor as well. So uh, basically this was 400 VIPs in Washington, DC, across the, the political spectrum, um, a lot of fun. Um, we had a, a panel discussion after the film, uh, the great, uh, there I am at the end, and next to me is the great Gilbert Gottfried, a comedian um, and all around interesting guy. And then Greg Lukianoff, the president of FIRE, Kareth Foster, a good friend of ours and one of the comedians, um, who was featured in the film. And the film actually helped uh, get her a lot more speaking engagements. So she's 
she's going to college campuses all over the place uh, talking about how comedy can be used to broach sensitive topics and talking about why it's important to allow free speech to reign. And next to her is Courtney, and then next to Courtney is a, uh, an attorney with the ACLU. And you can see at the end, we, we even got a standing ovation. <laughs> and who's that? Serby, I, I, I see that she's, she's on the <laughs> list here. Hey, Serby. Uh, Serby is a young woman from India who we met at that very screening, and she's become very good friends with us, and actually very good friends with, with Lindsay, too. Uh, she's she's just great, very smart and very funny. Um, we don't like the fact that she snuck into the event. Yeah, she's okay. Yeah, so, um, but we'll, it's not the time to discuss that. So, uh, so, what, um, so as I mentioned, we are now friends with Serby and Courtney, why don't you tell us what we're doing? And we're developing a TV series about her life as an immigrant uh, coming to America to attend college for the very first time and the cultural whiplash that she um, experiences. But, but more interestingly, she comes from a culture where people speak pretty freely and pretty bluntly. And that's not really accepted on the modern day American college campus. And she learned that the hard way. Uh, she's an inspiring stand-up comedian, and she's finding her voice in, in that realm. But she also learned quite a bit about what it's like to, to be an immigrant on an American college campus that is uh, not very friendly to uh, open expression and free speech as, as it should be. And Lindsay has been uh, working with us on this project, too. Yeah. Both to get the project uh, before the right people and to, uh, to help help serve you with her, with her acting skills. Uh, another thing that was nice from Can We Take a Joke was that it caught the attention of Seth MacFarlane, who's a, a comedy icon um, and um, best known for being uh, the, the man behind the, the big Fox series Family Guy. And, um, and Can We Take a Joke also inspired an episode of, of Family Guy. So that, that uh, brought the message of the film to millions more people. Um, this is one of our favorite things from Can We Take a Joke, and really all of our films, is, is college screenings. And Can We Take a Joke uh, has screened at more than 300 college campuses. Most of them were not shouted down. <laughs> um, we did have a bit of that. Um, and here is a big picture from Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles, which is the only women's university in Los Angeles, and it's a majority minority uh, campus. Uh, so most of the students are non-white. And here are some of the takeaways from, from the screening and the exchange I had with the students. Uh, one is, for instance, it is important to discuss controversial issues rather than push them under the rug. And another is free speech, even though it may be offensive to you, should still be respected. So. These are some responses that the professor who organized the event sent to me after the event. And it's really, it just, it was heartwarming for Courtney and me to, to read these um, um, because it shows that you can, you can reach uh, people who you at first uh, glance, uh, you know, just because they're college students <laughs> doesn't mean they're not open to free speech. So uh, what, we're, what were we just talking about? Impact campaigns. And uh, basically what you do is you, uh, what they involve is you're using film to educate people uh, and to reform policy. It's kind of like a political campaign, but the candidate is a movie. And the reason we wanted to bring it up, especially at, at this event, is because we, Courtney and I think that this is a really great career opportunity, especially for people who have an interest in, in film, but also have knowledge of economics, policy, and politics. Because let me tell you, <laughs> impact campaigns are tough work. Yeah. And we would, Courtney and I would much rather hire somebody to do it for us than to do it the way we've been doing it, uh, which is uh, just, just a lot of work. So it's actually an area that I think is underserved, especially for people who don't, uh, who have, views that may be out of step with with Hollywood for the most part. So any of you on online who are who have a background in in economics or policy or politics, um, even if you don't want to, at least for the sake of Courtney and me, consider a career in, in impact campaigns. 
Yeah, and more production companies and studios are starting to actually create departments completely devoted to that. Uh, one company that Ted mentioned that made North Country participant, they have an entire division completely devoted to how do we partner with organizations, how do we uh, do outreach, grassroots movements that uh, that help not only bring awareness to the film, but have help the film bring awareness to the issue so that it works everybody's working um, uh, side by side with, with the goal of there, there is a problem, this film was meant to help solve it, and these are the people that can help make the film have an impact. So it is, it, it is starting to sort of bloom into um, actual careers for, for people who are, you know, connected to organizations that, yeah. that are, you know, All right. spearheading let's, these issues. Let's, uh, let's shift to uh, session two. Uh, we can escape out of this. Mm -hmm. and I can unshare this. it, yeah. Uh, so uh, we also wanted to mention in impact campaigns at the end of our presentation because it's a very good segue into our discussion with uh, Pete Peterson from uh, Pepperdine School of Public Policy and Samuel R. Staley, uh, director of the DeVoe Moore Center at Florida State. Um, we're just really impressed with, with both of them and have, uh, I've, We've known Sam for a lot of years and, and Pete for the last at least couple. Um, and they both do things that are really innovative in, in the field and, and are intertwining film and policy and economics in ways that you just, you just don't see um, in departments um, like economics departments and public policy and so forth. So we already gave your impressive bios at the beginning. Um, Sam and Pete, so let's just dive into the, to the uh, Q and A and oh, I should also uh, remember to, to keep sending, uh, if you have any questions, uh, keep sending them uh, via chat to Courtney here. Um, so let's let's get it going. Session two with Sam and Pete. Um, let's start with you, Pete. Why did you, uh, how did you first get interested in mixing policy and film? I think it began with an uh, introduction to a gentleman by the name of Christian McWiggin, who um, is, was at the time a producer for participant media. And um, the person who recommended we connect had mentioned that he was doing a lot of work on policy related documentaries and wanted to talk more, uh, maybe be a speaker at uh, the policy school. And so we met for breakfast and I got a, uh, a two hour tutorial on impact campaigns. Um, and I had to say, as someone who had always, I'm a huge documentary film fan, um, but frankly, I'd always seen them as kind of being from the outside in, right? That uh, kind of Michael Moore model of, of running up to a senator or a, a governor or a mayor and sticking a camera in their face and asking very uncomfortable questions uh, was, was kind of the way that documentary films in attempting to influence policy was, that was kind of the model. And I think it was actually in the early days. But what I learned um, in that breakfast meeting and then since and getting to know you all is that this is a real inside outside process. Uh, one that has filmmakers as one part of the puzzle, uh, NGO and policymakers, think tanks is another part of the puzzle and then actual policymakers, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level, as the third part of this. And learning how much intentionality went into not only producing the actual film product, but making sure those relationships were built with the actual policymakers, and making sure that the film pro product itself was actually informed by people who were expert in policy, um, that, that was a real awakening for me um, to this broader field. And so that was the first step. And then the second step, I think, was, was beginning to see so many films, often short films, being created by think tanks, right? And so uh, you have the work that Reason has done, obviously, uh, but the American Enterprise Institute has gotten into this. They produced a film about a year and a half ago called uh, The Pursuit uh, that was uh, essentially looking at free market policy. And they've got another one coming out, I know, this fall on civic engagement. 
the Competitive Enterprise Institute did a great uh, film called I Pencil, which uh, some people may have seen that kind of looks at how the free market economy works and you know that you need these kinds of collaborations and interdependencies to make uh, free trade work and, um, and so forth. And so in some ways that led me back, there was a great Babylon B um, Facebook meme I remember a couple years ago, which had a picture of an oil tanker that was crashed on a shore. And instead of oil coming out of it, it was all these white, they obviously through uh, some sort of doctoring of the image, they photoshopped in a bunch of white papers that were coming out of the, uh, out of the tanker. And the caption of it was, think tanker crashes on course, sends white papers all over the coastline. <laughs> and, you know, that was kind of a way of thinking about, I mean, we send a lot of our students to go work in think tanks, and I want them to keep doing that. And they issue a lot of white papers. But you also need to be thinking about how are you impacting the broader culture? Because, as I think we all agree here, politics is downstream of culture. And, and what I've come to understand in just really the last 10 or 15 years the documentary films are a way of influencing culture that influences policy. And you obviously cited those examples. So it's a real exciting time, I think, for policy students to be thinking about career paths in new ways, especially in this film. Even if they go to work for a think tank, there are gonna be new opportunities in media um, like the ones that we're talking about here. That's great. Um, uh, yeah, Sam, uh, same question. How did you first get interested in, in mixing? Yeah, uh, my journey has been a bit more circuitous in this, but in some ways. I began, real. Uh, my background is in public policy think tanks, but I've also got an academic background. So I've got all sorts, but I'm trained as a social scientist. So the idea is quantitative data, it, you analyze the project in, this, in the study, and then you take those results and you take it to the elected official, and of course they're going to adopt it because they looked at all your brilliant analysis. <laughs> and then I get, uh, I realize that no, that's not what happened. In other words, uh, no matter how much data we could present to an elected official, we needed a story to go with it, or they wouldn't understand it. And so as a research director for a think tank, I began to really thinking about policy change. How do we actually get people motivated to shift? And, begin, and then I began realizing that every one of our studies and analysis actually had to carry a story with it. And then often what I'd be doing in the storytelling is I'm painting a visual picture. And so um, I think you may have mentioned earlier, I've written novels. So in terms of the literary component, I've been working on that as largely a hobby, but that informed my understanding of storytelling and how to actually structure a story that actually impacts someone in a visceral way that can then get them to change. And it was probably not, and I'm more of a narrative film guy. So the documentaries don't, uh, to me, I look at that as data that I'm just sort of collecting. Whereas the narrative forms for me are what really pull me in. And then as I teach social entrepreneurship, where we really dive deep into, so, into social change, what actually drives social change. This is about the time I started really also seriously reviewing narrative films for the Independent Institute and got scores of those under my belt. And I began understanding the visual component of this and how important that was. And so I began dabbling in different types of storytelling techniques. And uh, it's uh, so that has sort of brought me to a point where I think understanding film and understanding that this is the medium of this generation and how it fits into human psychology and social psychology motivates policy change. So, uh, Dan and Chip Heath, who are um, social entrepreneurs at Duke University, I rely on a lot of their work and a great book they have is called Switch. They talk about the importance of connecting to people on an emotional level in order to motivate them for change. And this is what I think filmmaking does. Um, well done filmmaking. We can also, so I always interested in why do certain characters fall flat? Why do certain plots not work? What is actually driving the success in the connection to the audience of any particular film. 
And so it's become more and more clear that if we are serious about public policy and changing the world, we need to think about these strategies for connecting content and ideas to the emotional and lived experience of the people we're trying to target. And then the other part of it is, I think, as economists and public policy people, we can actually make stories better because we understand the institutional context in which a lot of decisions are made. And filmmakers simply don't have that background. Um, they think, ah, government's just bad or government's just good. We can actually talk about what are the incentives? How does that set up character tension and conflict that propels story? So, so it's all been all of this stuff coming together and, and sort of recognizing and being, trying to stay in touch with my students who are much better at this than I am. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important insight, Sam. Like the, the more you know about a character, the richer that character can be and the more interesting and the more you know about an environment that that character may be set in, the, the same is true. Um, what kind of, uh, what would you, you and Pete are both interested in just kind of expanding the worldview of your students. What would you say to students who are in um, fields like economics or public policy, but who also have an interest in film? What, what kinds of, um, career uh, opportunities do you see or what, what advice would you give to them? Are we, start, are we starting with? No, we'll stick with you, yeah. Okay, all right, so I'm still on the hook. Actually, I think uh, you, as you segued into this segment, I thought it was great. I mean, it's sort of a natural place from a public policy background, whether it's economics, sociology, or social science. Um, sociology, economics, political science, public administration. The, there are natural connections into impact campaigns because what you're trying to do is motivate people to change policy or change the way they think. Having that background, that academic background and, some, and often lived experience background and understanding how that happens really helps inform what those impact campaigns would look like. And then I am a big fan of, we learn almost everything we need to about our job on the job. Um, so it's about showing your value added as you come into it. So I think data analytics has a role to play here. Business marketing has a role to play here. Um, those are on the more traditional ends. Um, a lot of our students have experience in political campaigns. In fact, I'm faculty advisor to FSU College Republicans and we have 1200 students that are self-identified and opting into that. And most of them are working on campaigns. So their experience can translate into the same kinds of tools and techniques you'd need if you're doing a social impact campaign. On the other hand, as um, Ted, uh, you mentioned, I was talking about as well, is that if you wanna get into the creative part of it, we can use that experience and knowledge to help flesh out stories that can be more engaging. And um, I personally find that uh, it's a target rich environment in Hollywood in terms of coming out with fleshed out characters that could be more engaging if they just understood economics better, which is kind of what my book is about, contemporary film and economics. It goes both those ways. So I'd say that, but um, literally I think we could probably sit down and come up with a dozen different job functions that would connect into uh, entertainment that would be a uh, would be a good segue from a solid um, social science background or a public policy making background. Great. How about uh, how about you, Pete? What what would you say to your uh, your students in that position? What kind of career paths and opportunities would you hope that they would at least look into beyond the usual paths of of, of government, politics, and academia? Well, I think what's so exciting about this time is that the avenues. Uh, for this intersection of, of media, film, and public policy are now bleeding into what you might call the, the traditional institutions, right? And so in preparing for this webinar, I, did, I just did a Google search on public policy and filmmaking and jobs, and there are thousands of positions. I mean, I, I was blown away, even as somebody who follows this field, how many production companies there are. So to look at one side, look at the production side, I think there are myriad opportunities for uh, people that have public policy awareness um, that can act as uh, advisors or consultants to uh, films. 
But the other part of it, again, is looking at the, the think tank and NGO side, which had uh, in some ways been disconnected from Hollywood and, and from film production more broadly. But over the last 10 years, there really has been a very close connection there. And so for those that would have otherwise thought, you know, I want to go work at Reason or I want to go work at the American Enterprise Institute or Heritage or whatever the case might be, or, or work for a more progressive outfit, um, those connections to production companies are on the increase. I think about a, a documentary like 13th, um, which looks at um, criminal justice reform issues. Uh, the people that were advising that film were coming from a, a variety of different um, public policy research outfits. And so even if you're, you're thinking that, well, I, I still wanna go work in a kind of a more traditional space um, whether it be an NGO or a policy think tank, those opportunities now to influence and advise on films are on the increase. And so I, I actually think that the field is, is broadening beyond thinking about applying to, to, uh, to your film company or to participant. I was looking at some working films, Argo, Atlas. I mean, you've got all these people in this space right now um, that are working on policy related documentary films. But again, that, that other side of the, the, the um, three part model here, the NGOs and think tanks are still great opportunities there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and Pete, earlier you mentioned uh, the phrase uh, politics is downstream of culture. Um, can you dig into that a little bit? Um, um, that's, that's an interesting phrase. Uh, what does it mean? Well, in some ways, I, I'm just drafting off of what Sam said, right, is, you know, one of, if, if I have a policy expertise, it's in public engagement and how governments engage residents in making policies. And one of the things I've learned over and over and over again, first, is that a, even given all the same policy constraints, a policy a uh, solution that will work in Santa Monica, won't work in Fresno, won't work in Atlanta, right? And so making sure that you're aware of the cultural environment in which you're working is so important for policymakers. So then the next question becomes, how is that culture set? And the increasing awareness of, of uh, the broader public on political and policy issues through uh, documentary and narrative uh, documentary films, I think is a great opportunity for policymakers who want to communicate these things. I think about a film like um, Waiting for Superman. You know, it's one thing to, to talk about, you know, education reform, but unless and until you see the actual stories who have been impacted by where we are in our K-12 school system, um, you don't you need to engender that public support for making policy change. And much as Sam said, and, and this frankly, I think is the challenge for the entire public policy academic world. It is simply not enough to have good ideas or even the right ideas. You can even have the right ideas, but if the public doesn't sustain them, uh, they will not be enacted, implemented and supported. Um, as I often say, you don't make public policy in a test tube. Uh, it's not going to come out the same way every time. And that gap between policy idea and, and public support is, is driven or supported uh, by narrative and the kind of storytelling that, that Sam teaches. And, and we are uh, continuing and, and in increasingly teaching here at the policy school. That's great. Um, yeah, we're just about to wrap up this session, but I want to get both of your guys' take on, um, you know, Courtney and I mentioned how excited we are to start this partnership with, with you both. And, um, you know, in, in the four of us talking, there's so many ideas. Uh, and, and so, you know, I want to remind everybody, first of all, that, um, that there will be a, a, a bigger event uh, coming to Pepperdine this fall. But Pete, let's, uh, let's have the closing um, response and start with you. What, uh, if you look down the line, you know, 10 years or so, what, what do you hope is gonna be happening in this space of public policy and film that, that isn't quite happening yet? 
Well, I, I think that there's a much greater awareness. I mean, academia is notorious for working in silos, right? We call them disciplines. <laughs> and increasingly, there's been a movement in academia around cross-disciplinary approaches to teaching. Uh, the connection that we haven't seen is the connection between the public policy programs and the filmmaking programs. We've, we've seen it to a degree between communication schools and public policy, but even that is still in its very early stages. And so what I would hope is that we see many more of these hybrid approaches. I mean, we're certainly exploring creating a communication specialization within our master's of public policy degree here. Um, to be, again, much more intentional about this intersection because, again, especially in the world of policy and politics, it's not, again, just about having the right quantitatively proven uh, policy solution. It needs to be sustained by the public. And the communication skills and storytelling skills that you all are just so familiar with in filmmaking, whether people go into filmmaking after they graduate from us or just take the skills and abilities to tell stories, uh, that is really going to be so important for the policymakers and, and frankly, public leaders of the future. Yeah, that's a great point. There's, there are a few things more fundamental to being a human than telling stories. Yeah. And we've been doing that for a lot of years. Um, Sam, final thoughts uh, from you. Uh, what, when you look 10 years down the line, what do you hope to see? Well, I'm going to focus a little bit on the, on the outside the university world because the university is notoriously for lagging all, as, almost as much as public policy is in terms of culture. I am analy I'm analogizing film now to where computer scientists were back in the 1980s and late 70s. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, computer engineers, even systems engineers, were very elite um, because there just weren't that many of them. And we're, we're going to this computer age. Now, if you go and look at labor markets, you find that systems engineers and, and, and computer engineers are embedded in every function of the economy to the point where we've commoditized a lot of those elements that were creative before. I think in 10 years, we're gonna see film as being as embedded in the business sector and the nonprofit sector as engineers are now. Um, you can do, I mean, you can get a job coding and it's like an entry, a well paid, but an entry level position. Whereas 20 years ago, that would have been an elite position, but it's going to become so widespread that in 10 years, if you don't understand these communication strategies and how these technologies work, you're actually going to be behind and you're not going to be very productive and you're not going to add value. And I see that in my students right now. In fact, that they're pushing us to do more with film, simply because that's how they process, that's how they learn, that's how they're integrating information and data, and they are far better equipped than I am uh, to actually do this, but I can actually provide the infrastructure that allows them to do that. Um, so that's kind of where I see it. I think it's going to be everywhere, and everyone's going to understand it, and then the question is how do we move beyond whatever that model is 10 years from now in adding value. Excellent. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Pete. Um, uh, that's, uh, that concludes uh, uh, their session. Now we move to uh, Lindsay Weissmuller and uh, a casting director's take on making important ideas entertaining. And uh, some people are already uh, uh, sending us uh, questions via chat, which is great. You can either do it publicly or privately to us. And if you do it privately, send it, send it to Courtney. Um, so please uh, send your questions and we will get to those at, uh, right after Lindsay uh, during the Q&A session. So please uh, welcome Lindsay Weissmuller. Courtney. Hey, Lindsay. Hey. So, um, why don't we just kind of start with some pretty uh, basic information. Can you just briefly describe what does a casting director do um, from start to finish? Uh, casting directors run on to a film or TV show or commercial, you know, what, whatever area you're working in. I mostly work in film and TV. And um, you're brought on to essentially supply options of talent to the producer and director, um, 
be a consult, you're a consultant, you're a director, you are um, a therapist, you're an investigator, <laughs> you're all those things. And so I pretty much um, bring the best level of talent possible for each role in a film that I'm responsible for in front of the director and producer and talk to them about the upsides and downsides of different options for each role and assemble a, uh, an ensemble for um, a movie or a TV show that way. Yeah, and it's a, it's a hugely important role, uh, casting director, because uh, I used to say, uh, if you make something in LA or New York, there's no excuse for bad acting because there is so much to choose from in terms of talent. And the casting director is really the vein into that talent pool, but you're, you're also a curator. Um, you have to know the script and the character so well that you can recommend the best options and also have ideas outside of the box that are really exciting and, and can help push things forward. What got you interested in this line of work in film? I just thought it sounded fun and like something I would be good at and could do. And um, I think that it was Sam that said earlier, or maybe it was Pete, I, I can't remember. One of you all said earlier that you learn everything you need to know about the job on the job. So I wasn't actually sure if I wanted to do it or not, but I went out for, I went to LA during, um, when I was in school at UF for an internship and I entered at a casting office and I loved it. I thought it was crazy that people got paid to do it. And so um, I liked that you could sort of, I could sort of marry my passion for creativity and artistic expression through, you know, theater and film and also the sort of thirst I had to be a part of the business world and interacting with people in that way. Great. Uh, let's talk about uh, one of our favorite projects you worked on, Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, that dealt with some policy issues in certain episodes. Um, can you talk about some of the episodes that, that dealt with those types of issues and, and kind of how they made usually dry topics really visually interesting and entertaining? And, and maybe uh, explain, we assume everybody has, has watched the show, but you know, there, there's, there may be a few holdouts. Can you explain what the show, uh, the premise of the show is? Sure. Um, Out of Ruins Everything is, was a comedy series on True TV. It ran for three seasons and it started, uh, the, our lead, Adam Conover, who also created the show, created the idea from its very conception. Um, I think it started as like a stand-up show that he used to do that would basically take a topic and ruin it for you, ruin all your conventional knowledge about that topic. I think our first episode was about diamond rings and why, you know, they're not as special as you think they are and the history behind, um, you know, the major diamond ring distributors and stores and all that stuff. So he, We'll do that from topics like that to things like having a baby um, to, you know, more serious issues like gun control or um, police. Right. Yes. <laughs> so Wait, he ruined death? <laughs> he ruined death? It's it's all like really very that. specific things. Yeah, more responsibilities. Issue. <laughs> yeah, or like the Olympics and, you know, sponsorship. Just finding really specific things to enlighten enlighten people on in case they they may not have they may not have known otherwise. Yeah. yeah what great. what were some of the approaches that the that the series used to uh, make an otherwise kind of bland topic interesting? Um, so it was always about the character and the relationships. So when I know when the writers would appro uh, approach a topic, you have to find a vessel to, to communicate that topic in a way that people are going to relate to. And so that's what I always appreciated about the show is that the characters were coming from an authentic place. There weren't, even though the, the, the energy of the show was very fast and, and uh, so could get 
you know, a little heightened, the core of the characters and their conflicts and relationships were very grounded. And they were always looking for that in casting is to keep the characters grounded and real because sometimes we're putting them in really <laughs> ridiculous situations just to sort of illustrate a point. So that becomes even more important for the character to communicate that in a way that people are going to relate to. Yeah, yeah, the show did a great job of that and sometimes went to the absurd, but it, it totally worked. I mean, it, you know, you, I mean, to, yeah, to communicate complex ideas through comedy is in some ways ideal because it's, if you, if you can, if you can get someone to laugh or, you know, titillate them even, it's, uh, you have a much better shot of getting them to understand the concept. Right, so, exactly, because laughter is very uniting. Sure. Thing. It's, yeah something we all like to do. So yeah. Especially when you're laughing, you know, at something that, oh, I didn't know that, or, yeah. oh, I know that, or, you know, just, right. to, you know, right. bring people together in that way. Exactly. I, I, don't, think I don't think that the show was always about convincing people of things. I think that it was always really important to Adam. And I think this is important to keep in mind if you're making policy related material, that it was always really important to just communicate, to communicate the information that he had or that his perspective, everybody has a perspective and he was communicating his perspective. It wasn't, it, it gets manipulative if your goal is to try and com convince people of something. And sure. so I think that was also really important to them in their you know, approach. It wasn't propaganda, it was rather just this is his point of view and these are the facts and he laid it out in, in an entertaining way. I know yeah. that was always his, yeah, his sort of instigating intention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what a lot, of, it, a lot of filmmakers who lead with the issue, they, they just, they have this idea they want to convince you so, so badly that they, they hit you like a, a ton of bricks and, and a lot of times people just tense up and they get on the defensive and they're not in that immersive state where where you can lose yourself in a good movie or, or TV series. Are, are there any other um, projects that you've worked on that, that dealt with issues in, in politics or policy or economics or even just law or criminal justice or any, anything that... <laughs> you know, I can't really think of a lot that are mm -hmm. as sort of obvious as Adam Ruins Everything other than, and I think one of... One of um, you guys brought up before there are a lot of sort of shorts that deal with specific topics and I've done a few shorts in the past that were really specifically meant to address a certain issue um, I did one very recently that was nominated for um, best short at Tribeca this year um, called piece of cake that dealt with um, uh, the state of California made these like little silver balls that you put on cakes and cupcakes oh, yeah. illegal. I can't remember what they're, what they're called, but they made them illegal. Yeah. Um, and so it was just a funny short that had that issue as part of the storyline, but it was really a story about a father and a, and uh, wanting to not disappoint his daughter. And, um, and so we were able to get really good actors for that and it turned out really well um, because the focus was really making something that would be interesting to people. Um, and I've yeah. done a few short of one that dealt with uh, uh, bone marrow, bone marrow okay. transplant, Every, like yeah. organ donation type stuff um, that are, are topics that are really easy to get people on board with in a way. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think that in documentaries, certainly things are moving in that direction and slowly in narrative film and television, but there are just very specific things that I think the the state of the the um, culture, especially in Hollywood, is open to is open to doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a uh, speaking of the culture of Hollywood, a, lo a lot of people. Uh, think that Hollywood is interested in every kind of diversity except for viewpoint diversity. 
um, how true is that and how open do you think the culture is to kind of uh, liberty minded takes on things or stories? So when you say like liberty minded takes on things, I think that I, when I think of um, that, I think of libertarians being the most extreme progressives and the most extreme conservatives, depending on what the topic is. <laughs> and so I think that um, the, th the topics that tend to be tackled that are really in line with personal, uh, personal liberty happen to be the ones that are the most extreme progressive ideas. And so, uh, but there's a market for both because our country is very divided politically and in terms of viewpoint. And so I always find that libertarians are really can connect with people on either side about something. And so, I don't know, I guess I, I did a, I did a film a couple of years ago um, or a year ago or so that hasn't come out yet, but it's got a really, um, a really subtle sort of faith based element to it. And I know that's not specifically a liberty issue, but maybe speaking along the lines of like a non Hollywood type issue. Um, and there is a market for that. There's an audience for that, but there's not a infrastructure to support that necessarily in Hollywood. So that's a project that came straight out of, uh, the director, the producers, most of them were in Texas and that's where the money came from. And so it's just sort of like an, it was a little bit of a, um, like an outside of LA sort of, that's where it came from. And so I think that we see that a lot for things that aren't necessarily traditional things that Hollywood might be interested in. Right. Excellent. Well, uh, let's, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Let's, uh, let's segue into our uh, Q&A session. Uh, so if you've got Q's, we've got A's. Uh, and send, it, uh, send your questions uh, to us via chat. We have a couple here, uh, one from Lexine. We'll, we'll, stay, we'll stick with Lindsay and we'll pose it to you first, Lindsay. Uh, what recommendations do you have for students who are interested in filmmaking slash policy? Um, I would say to, it depends what you're interested in, right? Um, if you are interested in creating content from start to finish, maybe a producer or a director, um, I kind of would, would say the same thing that I usually say to actors and it is to start as grassroots as you're able to start and focus on getting eyeballs on your work as long as it's good. Um, <laughs> if it's not good, don't get the eyeballs. Um, cre perfect your craft. Um, if you're more focused on policy and you don't necessarily have the skill set to put together a short film or something that's, that could go to Tribeca and get a theater full of people's eyeballs on it, then you need to surround yourself with people who are able to do that and are able to bring your ideas to the screen in that way. And it can be small. It doesn't have to be anything super professional or with a big budget or anything like that. As long as the ideas are good, the characters are good, the story is something that people connect to. Great, and, and Sam, uh, you, you said that you wanted to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, I, I may be broadening Alexine's question or my response to it a little bit, but um, I kind of picked up on the storytelling part. Um, one of the things I think it's important to do if you're going to get into this industry is understand storytelling. And that is actually something we neglect a lot in public policy. My entire outreach team is largely English majors because they understand storytelling yeah. and they understand the importance of how to connect with people. And um, if anybody on this call wants some, uh, wants me to send them some resources, I can do that because I've actually run workshops on storytelling 
at writers conferences. But there's a great book if you if you've really not done much on storytelling yet and you need some place to start, a great book by Robert McKee called Story, which is actually about filmmaking. But it goes through all the elements of storytelling and what it takes to create a compelling story. And I've had a numerous authors tell me that that is a great book as well, because it gives you everything except how to format a screenplay, which mm-hmm. is something I struggle with uh, still to this day, but I have to make it a priority. So I would say um, part of what you're going to be doing and why I like storytelling is that you're going to have to pitch yourself to the people in the industry. Part of that is understanding what storytelling is going to be, but also part of that is having an understanding of what storytelling is and then how that can translate into adding value to whoever you're going to be working with. And then the last thing I'd say is network as much as you can. Come to this event in Pepperdine in the fall because you will meet people in person that will then become part of your network that will probably be in your network for the rest of your career. And uh, that's true outside of Hollywood. It's true in Hollywood as well. And my son's actually going through this. So I, I understand how that works on the, yeah. on the 20 yeah. something end of it too. So. so how about you, Pete? Do you want to weigh in on this? So what I do, especially because Alex is one of our students here at the Graduate Policy School. So I um, want to make sure that I'm responding to her very good question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, again, if, if you think about this world now as having three primary pieces to it, in other words, three primary employers, you've, you've obviously got the filmmakers and the production companies, you've got the, the think tank and NGO world, and then you've got the actual policymakers. Then thinking through where are the touch points there to what if you wanna be doing nothing but filmmaking, then exploring these opportunities in the increasing number of uh, policy related documentary film production companies would, would certainly be a way to do that. If you see that as a way of communicating stories, but it won't be everything you do, I, I agree with Sam's very good analogy on, on the growth of the computer science film. This is going to be an almost required skill in the years ahead for if you're gonna go work at, again, the, the reasons, Milken's, Heritage's, whatever, um, uh, or the NGOs, if you're going to go work for prison fellowship, if you're gonna go uh, work for uh, um, uh, the Wildlife Fund, if you're going to work for any number of policy related NGOs, then having that skill set, at least to the degree of storytelling, is going to be a part of what you do because that is going to be a part of all issue advocacy campaigns is going to be some sort of film product. It could be a a four or five minute piece or it could be a much larger uh, documentary. And so looking and exploring, like even like I did yesterday, just Google searching policy documentary jobs, it was again, it was remarkable to see the number of opportunities that I think uh, undergraduate as well as graduate policy students would qualify for. I'll I'll weigh in on that too and and keep sending your questions if if, uh, other people have questions. Uh, I mentioned, we mentioned uh, impact campaigns earlier um, and I'm just gonna keep harping on those. (laughs) Um, I think that that's a really important field for uh, uh, for any film that has a desire to do more than just do well at the box office and, and win awards. Um, I would recommend to anybody who's interested in, in policy and filmmaking to especially check out participant media. They, they are, um, Courtney and I um, model ourselves after them. We, we joke that we kind of uh, steal their playbook <laughs> and, and apply it to, uh, to issues that, that we feel passionate about. So. I would say uh, watch their movies uh, and, and more than that, see what, uh, what they did beyond the movie and how they used the movie to advance um, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to advance uh, from films, such as uh, the, the Capitol Hill screenings, the, uh, the lobbying efforts, um, and, and really just uh, changing uh, 
public opinion as well. But, and just to just really quickly uh, hop on what uh, what you were saying, Pete and, and Sam Lindsay. I, uh, Alex, if, if you're, you know, there, there's, there's so many different ways you can uh, create a film, whether it's narrative or documentary, you can either find filmmakers who have done it before and you're sort of the, you know, the, the driving force fundraising and making it happen. Or if you are interested in being the filmmaker yourself, we mentioned the Institute for Justice, the nonprofit law firm that uh, represented the Kilo case uh, just in front of SCOTUS. Um, they're a really interesting law firm because they take on eminent domain cases, stuff like that, but they almost cast the, their firm like a film, like a casting director. They only take on cases with really compelling people um, because they know the impact of public perception and they are mm -hmm. not afraid to play these, these issues out in the public forum. They, they, they don't want it to be in a vacuum. They want it to be publicized. They want people to know and talk about it. And the best way to get that type of, of sizzle and buzz is to have a human story that is outrageous or traumatic or triumphant. And so when you approach any issue oriented film, think about who is it happening to or who could it happen to. And the human element is always going to be way more compelling. If somebody had came to us and said, we want you guys to make a movie about eminent domain. What do you think? We would have said, all right, uh, okay. But somebody said, have you read this book called Little Pink House? Did you hear what happened to Suzette Kilo and her neighborhood and it got bulldozed mm -hmm. and she lost, but it changed laws. All That's interesting. That's not a movie about eminent domain. That's a movie about a blue collar woman who was threatened by really powerful people, who was an outsider, who didn't have the connections, who stood up because it's the right thing to do. And through that, we learned about this sort of esoteric unknown topic called, for the most part, called eminent domain abuse. So I would advise choosing stories based on people as opposed to just stories based on issues. And then your, your, the second part of your question was networking. Um, these events are great, great ways to do it. When the world fully opens up again, go to as many of these types of workshops and film. We, one of the things we love about Free Minds is, is the, the cocktail hour that happens after the presentations. People have met each other. People have collaborated because they've met at these events, which we're really happy to see. So uh, you can find, you can join Filmmaker. If you're a woman, there's Femme Fatales, I think is the name of the... Uh, group. There's tons of like women in film groups that you can join. Some are free, some you have to pay for. And they, they're all about networking events uh, for, that, for that very reason. And, uh, anyone else want to weigh in on uh, the question related to networking? Any, any advice for how to network? No, I have a question for you, for Ted and Courtney, though, if, mm -hmm. uh -oh. if you're ready for me. Oh, right. I'm ready okay. now. Yeah, so what, what I find interesting is because again, as someone who's now watching a lot of movies and reviewing them, but also as an economist, I sort of look at performance and the way the industry is changing. We've been talking about social impact campaigns. It's almost as if they're an add on into a, in a production sense they are, but it seems to me that the industry is changing so dramatically and it's going to be accelerated by COVID-19 and the fact that theaters have been closed and they're not even sure if they're going to open. These campaigns have to be fundamentally part of any distribution campaign anymore. I don't even think it's a question anymore. The, the, the number of films that were going, looking for box office success to be profitable was already small. It's even going to be tinier now. So it's going to be finding your market in the colleges, finding your market in, this, in the particular interest groups, figuring out how to create that grassroots support is really gonna sustain it. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of the independent film production companies having success. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is, that, do you, is that, would you agree or? Yes, uh, and, and it also brings up, um, uh, I think a, a, an interesting challenge too, because in the absence of the, the usual distribution outlets, um, I think there's, especially in our, in our niche of, of making important ideas entertaining, um, you can, if your top goal is, is just making money, then there's a big incentive to frankly preach to the converted. That's, uh, so if you have 
um, if you have an idea, that's why, you, you know, Michael Moore's documentaries do well, Dinesh D'Souza's documentaries do well. Um, they are really serving up red meat to people who agree with them for the most part. Um, what becomes more difficult is to have a conversation with somebody you don't necessarily agree with or to get somebody who's unsure about an issue or maybe hasn't considered it to consider it. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite reviews from Little Pink House was from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and, it, and it said something like, uh, yes, it's an entertaining movie, but to an ex it's also a public service because it made people think about an issue they previously wouldn't have thought about. So, it, so the, the difference, like one path leads to um, financial success and another path leads to cultural change. And you can, you can try to do both, um, but I think it's quite difficult. Um, and so the, the, the vastly more challenging way is to engage people who, who don't agree with you. Because if you're just, if, if somebody who already agrees with you, you know, watches your movie and they agree with you a little bit more, like what have you really done in the world? Um, uh, we've, we've had occasion to, to go into different environments, sometimes hostile environments. Well, and I think that, that that's, that's one of the questions a filmmaker has to ask themselves, right? Like, do you want to, it's, it's okay to preach to the converted. You can make a lot of money doing that. Dinesh D'Souza makes documentaries that perform very well economically, but he's not getting the Bernie Sanders audience to watch them. They won't watch them because they automatically know they're not going to agree with it or be on board. That's okay. That's a lucrative way to get into the filmmaking business. But if your goal is to reach other minds and other perspectives, then you're going to have to approach it differently. And it's not going to be propaganda, most likely. It's going to have to be something that's more palatable to, um, to people who may think they disagree with you, um, but you need to persuade them in a, in a way that isn't uh, offensive or insulting. Here's another question. Uh, how important is it to live in Los Angeles if you want to be in film? Uh, who wants to? Lindsay, do you want to weigh in on that? I think it's important, at least at first. Um, I wouldn't be living here if I didn't want to get into it originally. And, and now I love it. I think LA is one of the, maybe the brightest city in the world, I don't know. Um, in a lot of ways, not always. Um, but I think it's important for the reasons that a lot of these guys brought up uh, networking and networking doesn't just happen over email or Zoom calls, it happens in person and it's most of the time not even about film. <laughs> you just uh, have to be in a place and immerse yourself in uh, you know, the culture here to have the best shot at meeting the most people that you might end up working with just because there's a high concentration of them and all in one place. New York is also probably fine. Um, I don't know, because I've never lived there, nor would I ever live there. But um, <laughs> I like warm weather and bright colors. But um, but LA is, is wonderful in that way. And I think at first, it's really important. Um, and then maybe later on in your career, once you've become maybe a little more specific about what you're doing, it's a little bit easier to then either move out of LA, but close by where you can still commute or even out of the state and you can work on local productions or do something else that's industry adjacent. Yeah. Hey, Courtney, don't weigh in on that. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, I totally agree with you, Lindsay. I think a lot of it, uh, the importance of physically being in Los Angeles in the beginning of your career is, is access, uh, the ability to, to get to a job interview, quickly to go to these mixers to meet people. I mean, LA is a very heavily entertainment industry town, so you could meet someone at Starbucks. Um, but I do, I, I think that once you kind of create your, your niche or your, your thing and you, you, you've launched a career, I think it's less important because not everything is made in LA. In fact, most stuff is not made in LA. A lot of stuff is made in Georgia, all, all over the world. Um, in fact, people, 
sometimes move, like New Orleans uh, became a really uh, hotbed for film and TV production. And so people just moved to New Orleans because they knew I can work on that show. And then when that show's over, I'll work on another. And so that, that was going on uh, in, in Georgia, it's still going on in Georgia and uh, North Carolina. So those are also things to keep in mind. You just mentioned that, Lindsay, that you can you could work locally if there's a production in town. You don't have to live in LA. Because LA, you know, it's not for everybody. It's not the cheapest place in the world, but there are uh, neighborhoods outside of it that are more affordable, that you can still commute. And then eventually, once you become Steven Spielberg, you can live wherever you want. <laughs> Uh, Sam, Pete, do you guys uh, have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll double down on that, and uh, for for two reasons. One is, at the end of the day, your most important career prospects are going to be dependent on your networking, and your ability to network. And so, this is an industry that still has a very high concentration in LA. Um, I've I've seen it numerous trajectories of different. Um, people within this industry, and they've been able to move out after they've created their their foundation because they then have a network that they can leverage and they don't have to be in person. By the way, same thing works in terms of online kinds of work as well. And Ted and I, of course, were working for Reason, which was completely virtual um, mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, the other part, though, is I'm going to use an example of Florida State's film school which is one of the top film schools in the country. I think it's an, also having been through this and looked at this pretty intentionally, the question was, for when I was, my son was actually looking at this, how important was film school to him being in the industry? The reality was it wasn't important. The question was what schools were gonna give him access to the network that he wanted. And he went to, into Columbia College in Chicago. Same thing's true in, in um, so at Florida State, we have one of the top film schools. Their target is Hollywood. It's not Florida. They, and, and in fact, I think, Courtney, you and I were talking about how Florida State is now becoming more and more um, known within the industry. Well, that's because for 30 years, the university has been cultivating a program that's targeted toward placing the graduates in LA. They don't do anything in Florida and they don't even, matter of fact, they don't even talk a lot to the other disciplines outside of the film school because they are laser focused on that. And I think it just reinforces what you said. You need to go to where the access to the network is and where you can develop those relationships early in your career. That's not any different from any other profession. It's just that the geolocation of this is different than where it used to be. And, it, and it's, yeah, so that's all I would say. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll just add on to that really briefly because I know we don't have too much more time. Um, there are a lot of people who want to work in film and TV, and so it's not like they're, uh, it's not like there's this dearth of <laughs> talent and, and interest. So um, be prepared to uh, take on a job that you were way overqualified for. You are being way underpaid, maybe not paid at all in the beginning simply to create the relationships because that will that will turn into other opportunities so you have to kind of go in at the ground level prepared to go get someone's coffee and dry cleaning and not get paid for it for a few months but then knock it out of the park show them how amazing you are and then that's when you you start moving up the ladder and that's that's just something to be prepared for. It's, it's not one of those careers, it's not like computer science where you get your degree from a great university and you get hired by Google and get six figures. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. It happens sometimes, people get lucky, but it's, it's, it's very much, you know, ground level entry usually, unless you've, you've made like a, an award winning short student film that, you know, got a nominated for an Academy Award or something like that. Pete, do you want to weigh in on uh, whether folks should move to Los Angeles or not? Yeah, just very quickly, I think it, it comes back to that center question about what do you want to do at this intersection of policy and filmmaking? Do you want to be a filmmaker? Then I agree with what you said and Lindsay said and Sam that, that LA is, is really the place to start, although I have fonder feelings about New York having been born there. Um, that being said, I, I think what's so important about this conversation is that there are a lot of different entry points, right? I'll just say again, if you're going to go work for a major NGO uh, or even a smaller one working on any kind of issue, 
what I'm hoping comes out of this in the days, weeks, months, years ahead is that those policymakers, when they think about how are we going to communicate this message as opposed to just saying, well, we're going to get through this great white paper and I'm sure it's going to win everybody over. They're going to say, you know what, there was somebody who was really affected by this policy and we need to tell their story. And if we tell their story right, we're going to win the policy discussion. And so you might be coming from the inside of the policy world out and access somebody like you all to say, we need to bring in free minds to come in and help us tell this story because that's the way that we're going to win the policy debate. So again, it, it, it really depends on what, where you want to be. But the fact that all these worlds are coming together is obviously there's no doubt about that. Good point. Uh, we, we're right up at uh, the, the end, but I want to squeeze in one more question. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to rephrase it a little. Um, okay, so the idea is if you're, um, if you're, uh, if you're into film, but you're more of a libertarian or conservative, is it better to start in that, that sphere uh, as a libertarian and conservative or to start mainstream? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, do some just lightning round responses. <laughs> Um, I'll, and I'll go first. Um, I would say you can do it either way, but I would have a preference for starting mainstream because you can always, uh, it's a lot harder to go uh, niche uh, to mainstream rather than mainstream to niche. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it is. Um, I, I think that um, you, you can cut your teeth a little bit faster on more mainstream product than the niche product. Um, I, I think, you know, this has come up a few times, learning on the job, learning on the job. And a lot of film school can be fantastic uh, for a lot of different reasons, but um, you, what you, when you really learn how to do it, it's when you're doing it, when you're actually on a set or you're really making the documentary or you're shadowing someone who is. So, um, and I just think that if you're open to working on, on more mainstream projects, that's a, that's a good way to just learn the craft before you can start zeroing in on an edge. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Definitely agree with that. Um, just because you have to understand the industry as a whole in order to navigate it, unless you're very lucky otherwise um, to infiltrate the industry by just like making a unicorn project um, outside of the industry. And so I think it's really important to just understand how the industry works and the people and the culture and all of those things you can, you can get by even just working at an agency or working at a production company or something or doing an internship or something like that to start out just to start to understand the way that people communicate and the things that are important to people and the hierarchy of how things work um and i you know i'd love to see people you know bust in from the outside with new fresh ideas and say i'm not going to do things that way this is how i do things no matter what it is but um that's really hard to do and if if you manage to do that wonderful if um that's not you know feasible necessarily starting mainstream and just sort of working your way up that way is a really tangible linear sort of path towards making connections, the connections you need to then have more freedom to do what you're passionate about. That's great. great. Yep. Sam, Pete, any uh, quick thoughts on that? Um, yeah, actually, and I'm going to bring an employer's perspective to this. I started my first free market think tank in 1989. Um, my most valuable employees have been the ones that were ideologically aligned, but had started in the mainstream. They built up their credentials, their understanding of the programs and the processes, and they understood the people and the dynamics, and then they could bring that into my organization. So I think you actually have more hurdles, as I think Ted said, if you start in the niche and then try to go mainstream. But I really think spending the first couple of years in the mainstream, in my case, that's also true. I am far more valuable because I'm respected as a social scientist, not because I'm a libertarian. Um, so I think you bring a different element to it. Yeah. 
Pete, any final thoughts? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. But again, it gets back to that question of what you want to do. You know, I was just thinking as we were talking, we had uh, a student here by the name of Eli Steele, who was um, oh, yeah. he's a friend of ours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he was a graduate of our program. And again, someone who uh, had an interest in a, in a, a whole series of, of topics. You know, there are different ways into this. One can be a producer, but you can also essentially write stories, right? And I think, I hope that this discussion and one that's ongoing, that for the person who's interested in policy and politics and says, I'm gonna write a book about it, or I'm gonna write an op-ed about it, thinks that actually this could be another avenue. I think what you did with Little Pink House is just such a great demonstration of the power of storytelling through film. And the fact that so many of these policy and political subjects lend themselves, you know, I just think about another like series like Chernobyl, you know, I mean, some of these things you don't even take to be policy or political on its face or Richard Jewell, which I watched the other day. I mean, th there are these themes here which are just deeply policy and politically related that the only way to effectively tell them is, is through film. And so just making sure that our students if they don't even get behind a camera, can even be writing stories or conceiving of them for uh, film in some way, shape, or form, just like Eli did and is doing. Awesome, well said. Yeah, and Eli has attended many uh, Three Minds film events, and hopefully we'll see him back in yeah. the We'll see yeah. him in the fall. Pepperdine in the fall. So we're going to have to leave it there because we want to end on time. We know you're all busy people. So thank you very much to, to Pete, to Melissa, to the all of the, the Pepperdine staff behind the scenes. Thank you to Lindsay. Thank you to Sam. Thank you to all who logged on. And thank you to Courtney. Thank you to Ted. And we will see you all, uh, hopefully, at Pepperdine in the fall. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.